I mean, our number one goal with resistance training, right, is to have that person get stronger. And that's the, our objective measurement of improvement. And over time, as that load increases and that absolute intensity increases, it's going to affect them eventually metabolically. But I mean, our main goal is to get them stronger in the ad muscle. This is episode 31 of the Inform Fitness Podcast, 20 minutes with New York Times bestselling author, Adam Zickerman. I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network and client of Inform Fitness at the Toluca Lake location, which is co-owned by our very own Sheila Melody, who will be with us shortly. Also joining us, as always, is Mike Rogers, the general manager of the Manhattan location of Inform Fitness. All right, so we're about to kick off a two-part series talking about genetics. Now, hold on. For those of you who might be scientifically challenged like me, don't think that this information is going to sail right over your head. Because joining us is exercise physiologist and certified master trainer, Ryan A. Hall. Ryan does a terrific job of explaining how our individual genetic makeup affects the results from our high-intensity strength training. Are you oxidative or glycolytic? Have no idea what that means. Neither did I until Ryan explained it. I guarantee as a listener of this podcast, I know that you're going to find this information not only entertaining, but very helpful. Ryan has over 25 years of experience in the health and fitness industry. As a matter of fact, he contributed to chapters 3 and 8 in Dr. Doug McGuff's book, Body by Science, which is an absolute staple for this protocol. Oh, and one final note before we begin. For those of you who participated in our month-long contest to receive Adam's autograph, Inside his New York Times bestselling book, Power of Ten, The Slow Motion Fitness Revolution, and to receive Inform Fitness Apparel and an Amazon Echo, we will announce our winner at the end of the episode. In the meantime, let's talk genetics with Mike Rogers, Sheila Melody, Adam Zickerman, and our guest for the next two episodes, Ryan Hall. Ryan, you and I go back a while now. We've been, we've been in this game. You said you started this at 18 years old, correct? Yeah, it was like 1989. Yeah, when I started. Yeah, how old are you now? <laughs> 45. I'm old, dude. He's a baby. <laughs> hey, 25 years, 26 years of doing this. Yeah, long time, man. Long time. How many sessions have you overseen in in, in these 25 years? Would you estimate? So at one time, at one to one, I was training between 100 and 120 sessions a week, and uh, I mean sometimes I've trained a wow. lot less. But I averaged it out to maybe about 80 training sessions a week. And I gave myself a margin of error to say maybe 75 a week. And so um, I multiplied that out by about 50 weeks a year. And I'm coming, clocking in around 100,000 sessions. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. So I guess that means, yeah, I'm doing this 20 years. So I'm probably, you know, I'm probably just about 20,000 less than you. Yeah, and I would say probably around that, yeah. Mike, Mike uh, is averaging that amount of sessions per week now, uh, 90 to 100 uh, a week now, and he's been doing this like 12 years, 15. 15 years, excuse me. So, I mean, between the three of us alone, we got, we got quite a number of sessions under our belt. So, Ryan, like me, you're, you're an exercise geek, and isn't it true that uh, for fun that you dig around for relevant and quality research studies? <laughs> <laughs> just all just the, for fun, fun. Uh, all the time. I mean, I pretty much keep my nose in the research literature every day. And uh, talk about your, you have a couple of college degrees, correct? Like, what are they? So, both my undergraduate and graduate degrees are in exercise physiology. I had gotten accepted before I opened one to one. I had gotten accepted into the PhD program in Baton Rouge. Uh, LSU um, for exercise phys, but I decided to open a business instead. So <laughs> I said, I'm not going to continue getting myself in debt. And uh, that's when we opened one to one in 1996. But my education didn't stop. Uh, you know, when I stopped going to school, I mean, now it just gave me the freedom to research and read exactly what I wanted. So I didn't have to follow any syllabus. Uh, or anything like that. I learned most of what I learned, Adam, honestly, by doing experimentations of my own clientele and actually writing my own research papers. That way I could, you know, that way I could target in directly at what, what I wanted to study. 
So you like, yeah. So, so between all the, the, the hundred thousand sessions that you've overseen, not to mention your background in exercise physiology and all the research you've been doing and all the digging your nose into all the current research, uh, you've discovered and you've noticed a couple of things, I would say. Uh, and, and today's discussion is really about genetics. So what have you discovered regarding genetics and people's response to exercise, generally speaking, right now? Well, I mean, first of all, genetics are extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, I think the last estimate I read, um, it was about 60% of all of your results from exercise are pretty much gen genetically predetermined or at least limited. Um, and so there's a, <clears throat> by looking at my own clientele that I've done and my trainers and the research literature, there's act, there's a huge amount of inter individual variability, uh, between results from exercise. And so, you know, there's people, very few, these are really far outliers that gain, let's say a lot of muscle mass, you know, from normal, I, I just, it's, I shouldn't say normal research protocols, but higher volumes of resistance training, okay, like three days per week, multiple sets. There's only a few people who actually adapt really, really well to that. And also, there's people who lose muscle mass and strength on such programs. Depending upon the stimulus that we initiate, right, we can observe or maybe we can make some observations on how those clients respond. And depending on those observations or how I'm going to structure their routine going forward. But the thing is, is as that client continues to adapt, uh, you know, the stimulus is going to have to be changed a little bit more to fit their new adaptation levels. So uh, that's what I've been doing a lot of work on lately. Ryan, how do you know when a client has adapted? Is it a plateau? How would you define adaptation? In science, we usually want to have an objective measurement of improvement. And for me, our one objective measurement of improvement are consistent strength gains. And so that's the first adaptation that I'm looking at that we can measure from workout to workout. Okay. Um, so that's what I'm mostly looking for. Now, as they continue to adapt, as they continue to get stronger, they may, for example, hit a plateau at some point in time. And the thing is, is you need to figure out what you need to do to get that past that plateau. Okay. So when I was in grad school, I conducted a study and there's, um, there is a link on my website, uh, it's uh it's an article it's called exercise results curve and by this time i had already trained you know several hundred people well a few hundred people i should say a handful and you know some of these for multiple years well what i started to do i had to do a project uh for exercise phys for one of my exercise phys classes and what I did was look at all this neat data that I had on the workout charts. So I started entering everything into Microsoft Excel with the statistics package and, you know, trying to analyze this data. And what I really wanted to see was that if we correctly manipulated stimulus and recovery, um, how long did it approximate these individuals to, to come close to their genetic potential? Okay. Um, but there was something, there was an anomaly that appeared in the data that I wasn't necessarily expecting right away. And the anomaly that appeared in the data is that the people that I started training twice per week made results faster, but they hit an artificial plateau much, much sooner. And it was almost 100%. It was 97% of my subject population. When I reduced the frequency of training from twice a week to once every five days or once a week, there was almost an immediate improvement in strength where they continued gaining strength. And again, I said this is 97% of my subject population. So there's a small percentage of people uh, who did not do better changing from once a week. They didn't necessarily do any worse, but they didn't do any better. And so, but most people did, and that was the number one aspect that stood out in my mind as most significant. That's 97%. So you'd say for the most part, 
on on the bell curve, uh, most people do well with a once a week workout, working out one set to failure in general, right? Is that what you find with your population of clients over the years? Adam, I would say so with my subject population now. I mean, I'm real specific to say that because we have selection bias in just about everything. And I don't even know if we can have a true random sample in exercise research. Okay. Right? But, okay. Why don't you explain for us what selection or survivorship bias it's also known as. Ex- explain that a little bit. What is su- selection bias? Sure. Okay. That's a great question too. So naturally we gravitate towards things we do well at. Okay. If we don't do well at something, we're probably not going to continue with it or at least not try. So, I mean, it can be in any type of sport and any type of activity. It could be like if I don't if I don't do well at playing chess, I'm probably not going to be very competitive. <laughs> I'm not going to continue playing chess. If I'm not large enough to be a football lineman, I'm simply never going to get selected or ever be a football lineman. Um, so, you know, that's there's some genetic dictation with that also. Um, and the, the 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 latest statistics I looked at is that maybe about I think it was 10% of the U.S. population actually p- participates in strength training. So <laughs> I- I- in order to even you know want to participate in strength training, that's something that you have to be interested in. I'm not going to say everybody has to do that very well, but that you have to be interested in that. Now, there's guys that are genetic freaks, right, that tend to just go to any gym – and pick up weights and start throwing them around. And those people are far and few between, but they make great results. I mean, my, one of my, one of my tagline statements is there's guys that just have great genetics. I could probably throw tomatoes at them and they'd still kid big. (laughs) So, um, I I use a similar, I say if somebody just looks at a barbell, they start getting bigger. (laughs) uh, Yeah, absolutely. They take it, they smell it or what smell a gym and they get big. So, you know, but, but for otherwise, so, you know, if we look at people that are going to seek out a trainer, we're likely to get people with average to below average genetic potential because these are people that did not do well on their own. Okay, but even in the research literature, it shows that those people that do well, it's there's a positive skew, and what that what that means is is that there's a few individuals that do really really well that throw off the average result. And some of these people do exceedingly well. well. Some of the research I've looked at is that literally with a fairly short-term resistance training program, it was relatively high volume, that there's people that – a few guys that gained up to a 60% increase in muscle mass. But there was only like two people that did that. <laughs> the rest of the people made average results – and some people even uh, lost muscle mass and strength. I, I agree with you. I mean, again, you know, both of us have a lot of experience with people. And given the uh, selection bias, and I agree with you, I think most people that seek out our services are, are baby boomers in general. They're affluent. Right. And they are the average type. We're not getting too many professional athletes in our gym because, you know, yeah. again, like you said about selection bias, I think people that do really well with strength training – naturally they don't need a trainer they 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 go they smell a gym and they get bigger and uh you know they move on they, why do they have to why do they have to pay the money even if they can afford it they they're doing fine all by themselves absolutely 100 percent agreement so so yeah so when we start training people they 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 do i would say most of our clients and we've been doing this for a long time we have lots of clients and i would say they are of average genetics Yep. So let, let, let's dig deeper into this genetics for a second, all right? So um, one, one of the big, big determine, uh, determining factors of somebody uh, seeing results or how they should train is, is based on their blend, if you will, of fast twitch versus slow twitch and intermediate, even the intermediate twitch muscle fibers. And uh, I would assume that if somebody possesses a large amount of one or the other or a blend of one or the other, their, their training protocol might, might vary accordingly. So before we get into that, why don't, we, why don't you speak to and explain to our listeners uh, about what, what exactly is fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers because there's a lot of confusion around that. Okay. And so this is actually, 
I mean, it, it can be a, a difficult topic to discuss. It can be technical. But um, so we don't normally. That's why I asked, that's why I asked you the question <laughs> instead of answering. So, okay. I'd, rather, I'd rather you answer that question than me. So <laughs> let me think how to describe this. You know, it's funny because I have like visuals of this that are easier, but this is an audio format. So the deal is that we can think of. Um, we use the term twitch to describe the motor neuron or the neuron which is in the spinal column. And all of the muscle fibers innervated by that neuron, that's called a motor unit. Okay. And the motor neuron is what twitches. So when we call, when we specifically start talking about fast twitch or slow twitch, we're actually talking about the motor neuron or the motor unit. The muscle fibers themselves are usually stained for enzymes, and that's why we normally use the term fast glycolytic or slow oxidative or what's called fast oxidative glycolytic. And oxidative enzymes are going to really be more specific to endurance type training, okay, or longer times under load, okay. So they're fatigue resistant. They make Think about, I love automobile uh, analogies. It makes a lot of sense. Think about the slow oxidative fibers as a Honda Civic, uh, you know, or one of those Fiat 500s, right? It's a small engine. It doesn't make a lot of horsepower, right? But it gets great gas mileage, okay? Now, think of those really large, fast glycolytic fibers. They're very strength-based. That's more strength tissue, okay? Okay. So think of a a Hemi V8 in the quarter mile running off a nitrous oxide, right? Makes a lot of power, a ton of horsepower, but done in, you know, 10 to 12 seconds or whatever the case. Boom, it's out. Now, Now, these classifications are convenient teaching tools for students, but a, a fiber can lie anywhere on that oxidative to glycolytic spectrum, okay? And muscle has a high degree of adaptability. So depending upon how it's used, it can adapt and change uh, its enzymatics or enzymes properties, either oxidative or glycolytic, the way it's being trained. However, there's only so much adaptation that that can occur through normal exercise, a normal exercise stimulus. So where you are born on that oxidative glycolytic spectrum in that muscle is how it's going to generally perform best, okay? So glycolytic, fast glycolytic, those are strength-based fibers, and everyone's going to have – some people may have a little more of that than others, okay? And if someone has a lot of oxidative fibers, then they're going to be better at a longer time when they train, right, or more endurance-based activities, not strength-based. They're going to get great gas mileage but not put out a lot, a lot of horsepower, And so here's another analogy I use, Adam. Let's say um, Tim is more oxidative and I'm more glycolytic, okay? If we're both sled dogs, if we're pulling the same load, Tim could pull it farther than I could, right? But if the sled weighed a certain amount, he couldn't pull it at all and I still could. Is that a nice analogy? Kind of makes a... I do like it, especially since you made me... Go really far, really fast. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Now, most people are going to fit in the middle. Okay. So, with most people, we don't have to make severe adaptations in the training response. But what I find most interesting to me are the people, the individuals that fall outside of that or the outliers. And so, those are the people I, I love. I have a saying, you probably know this too. I love difficult cases because it makes me think a lot more and work a lot harder. I don't necessarily like difficult people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I <know. laughs> I but I do like the difficult cases because it really makes me work and use my brain a lot more in order to get those subjects that are the outliers, that lie to the outside of the glycolytic oxidative spectrum. Those are the people that make me think the hardest. I have to work harder to get those subjects optimal results from exercise. And that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy challenges. Is there a way that you can assess what a person is on that spectrum or what they are, what their tendency is toward? Absolutely. Um, So there's a way to do that. And, you know, 
And Adam can probably tell you from his experience also, we can do something called a one repetition maximum test. That's the maximal amount of weight that that individual can lift at one point in time. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of doing that because there's a certain injury potential that comes with doing that. Okay, so I'll only do this test with clients that have more experience, that are well trained, that have relatively perfect form. Uh, you know, there's no slop in the form, there's no jerking, there's no heaving or anything like that. So you can do this one repetition maximum test and then take a percentage, generally 75 to 80 percent of that one repetition maximum. But you have to make sure that these clients are training with perfect form. If they're not training with perfect form, then that pretty much kills the test. Okay, And I like to pick exercises that are not as easily – as easy to cheat with. Okay, For example, something like the MedX chest press um, rather than a seated dip. If you're doing a seated dip, people can rock back and forth. You know, they're – they, you know, yeah, leverage, lifting, body leverage, yeah, yeah. Body, yeah body leverage, and all this other stuff. So that I don't like doing that test necessarily. But if you're doing something like chest press or overhead press to kind of give you a little bit of idea of what the upper body does, and then I generally pick leg extension. Um, you know, just because again, that's a little bit more difficult to cheat on. It, you're, there's less movement of the body that's going to come into play, and you could do other exercises, but they're more likely to cheat on those. Like let's say you do, you know, use the MedX bicep, right? People are going to they can they can lean back into it, right? I mean, arch their back, stick their belly forward. They, you know, they try to cheat with it. Or if you're doing lateral raises, it's an independent movement arm, right? And um they might not be doing full range or whatever the case may be. But if you take this 80% on some specific exercises and you have that client go to failure, again with imperfect form, you're going to see a variety of responses between individuals. And people that have more strength-based fiber or more glycolytic fibers, fast glycolytic, are going to lift a heavier load, but they're going to get less repetitions and be on the machine for a lower time. On the other hand, people with oxidative fibers, the more endurance-based tissue, they don't have enough of those strength-based fibers to lift a very heavy load, but they can go for a very long period of time. And so those people are the outliers again. And so they're more difficult to get results with. Um, but they're more interesting, in my opinion at least, to work with because it requires some more thought process and some more skill for the trainer in order to get those particular clients great results from exercise. You know, so, when, so for, let's use an example for a second just to make sure it's clear for everybody listening. So a one repetition max, meaning the most you can lift in, in one repetition. So let's say the most a person can lift on a leg extension machine for one repetition is 100 pounds. So what you do is you take 75% of that number, so 75 pounds. You start putting them through a set at 75 pounds. And you're doing it in perfect form. So let's say a, a slow protocol, like 10 seconds up, 10 seconds down. With nice turnarounds, not jabbing at it, not, not resting at the bottom turnaround or anything like that. And they end up lasting, let's say, 60 seconds until failure versus somebody else that can also do a 100 pound repetition max and then they do 75 pounds and they end up lasting for let's say three minutes so you'd be able to say all right the person that lasts three minutes is more of the slow twitch oxidative muscle fiber type whereas the person that lasted only 60 seconds is more of the fast twitch uh glycolytic type true Absolutely, yes. That's okay, so, so here we are. So that we got that straight. So now, how do you train each person? So you discovered, all right, this person is glycolytic, fast twitch muscle fiber type, and then you have another person here who is definitely you know, the, the endurance type. So how do you design the protocol accordingly? So you know, what I would do is that basically that time under load, that repetition scheme, is going to be what I'm going to use to train them. 
Well, what I found, though, in working with these subjects that sort of lie to the outliers is that fast glycolytic subjects, uh, they tend to increase on resistance more rapidly. So you can jump the weight at a faster pace where what we're looking for with the slow oxidative subjects, they increase on time much better. So if you – one of the things you'll see with um, – oxidative subjects, when you try to increase the weight significantly, it drops their time way down. And that's an observation you can actually make without even doing the one rep, you know, the 75 or 80% of one rep max test, is that you'll see those subjects wind up improving on time. So let's say I have someone that needs to be on three minutes or over three minutes. If I go up a little bit on weight, let's say two to four pounds, right? So I go up from 100 to 100 to 104 that time under load is going to be knocked down. They may be, you know, two minutes, 20 seconds or somewhere around there. In, and some, cases I, in some cases, I found that, you know, you, you even increase it four pounds, they can't lift it at all. And I think, I'm like, yeah. come on, you get mad at them because you really don't, you think they're, they're totally faking it. Right. You know? But it's not it, true. No, yeah, the, I, I think I think the uh, you know we don't do the one rep max test as you know, and and I think we find our answer or we get close to our answer within just a trend after a few sure. sessions. You know, you see how they adapt over like a, a little increase or a lot increase, and yeah. you can see it just takes. I think uh, the edge of the question that, that a real assessment takes you know a handful of sessions or maybe a little bit more even sometimes. You know. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, that's the way I prefer to do it. That's the way we normally do it. So um, and there's some things that you can watch for. There are some responses that you can watch for. Usually you'll see oxidative subjects. They don't get very winded or make a very, very intense cardiovascular response or metabolic response from the training stimulus. It's not it's not quite as high. I've done things like measure heart rate. And they just don't get all that high unless you're doing some really large uh, exercises for like time under load. Like we have that squat machine, Adam, that you know of or something like <laughs> leg press, right? Um, well, where you like, always me on, yeah. That yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> where where the, the fast twitch glycolytic more strength-based subjects is that their metabolic responses, their heart rate, their chest is, you know, the heart's pounding out of their chest with a short time under load. It's and it's so, a, yeah. yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's a good point because uh, we, you you observe lots of different people in the gym. We have several trainers in there and people are constantly judging, hey, isn't that person working hard? And we know that – we I know that that person's going to muscle failure but a little bit differently. But they display it. Uh, some people are very, very visually – uh, in, in an intense situation, whereas other people they're they're going to muscle failure, but it just doesn't it doesn't visually or or uh, yeah. audibly look like a very intense situation. But we know that they are, you know. So let's get back to that. So 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 let's talk. Let's continue to talk about this oxidative person, right? Who after they go to failure, it doesn't even seem like they uh, had any experience at all. Yet we know they went to muscle failure. So so how are you training this person? Are you are you just you're just kind of keeping the weight the same for a while and letting, letting them keep increasing in time until they reach failure. So let's say you're using that 75 pounds and they last three minutes and then you do it again at 75 pounds the next time they come in and they last three minutes and 10 seconds or 15 seconds and you do it again with the same, not changing the weight and they start to maybe even get towards four minutes and then you finally maybe raise the weight to let's say 78 pounds and then you see all of a sudden their time drops back down to like two minutes or something. So you keep it there for a while until they get back up to like four minutes. Would, yep. would you say that would be a, a, a good approach to somebody like that? That's exactly what we do, Adam, totally. As a matter of fact, there's a number – you you know, um, sometimes, like you said, it takes a handful of sessions to sort of figure this out. Sometimes you can almost figure it out in the first session. <laughs> there was this uh, – there was this woman who, uh, her name is Mary Lee, and she trained at another high-intensity uh, training facility in, in the New or- uptown New Orleans area. Ooh. And <laughs> Well, you know, it, that's what we – it actually <laughs> turned out that way. There were not – she was not being trained nearly as intense as we train people, okay? But the first time she came in, I put her on the MedX row, 
And I'm figuring, okay, she's been doing this for several years now. She should at least be able to handle like 100, maybe 140 pounds. So I put her at 140 pounds and she couldn't budget. So 140 pounds was not even her one repetition maximum, okay? I put her on 120 pounds and she stayed on for over four minutes. Right. So yeah. that is a, a definite example of someone who is extremely oxidative, extremely enduring. So, I mean, you know, let's say you could guess that her one rep max might be 130 pounds, whatever the case may be. But so her ideal training protocol was to keep her on until she was over four minutes and then bump the weight up. And what you found is when you bump the weight up even a little bit, her time under loads came way back down. But you, just like you said, they improve on time. And sometimes they'll improve, you know, I don't know, 40 seconds a minute at a time. You know, sometimes it's a big, big difference. Yeah, and then on the other spectrum, on the other on the other side of the spectrum, then you have these people with the glycolytic fast twitch muscle fiber types. You know, you, you pick a weight and they last a minute to failure. They're, they're like you said, they're they're breathing like a freight train. Their chest is pounding out. Their, their heart's pounding out of their chest. And then the next time uh, you, you raise the weight 10, 15, 20 pounds, and they they still last sixty seconds. They don't drop in time. And but but you can improve you can keep increasing the weight and they are always metabolically devastated. <laughs> right, uh, no, absolutely. And I've also found out that, and you probably noticed the same thing, is that over time, because those people are giving, you know, they're they're having these uh, extremely deep metabolic responses. Those are the people that we have to sort of reduce. Um, the number of exercises. So the total, because their intensity winds up being so high, they yeah. can't do as many exercises and they can't do it as long. We had one real outlier with that. One of my trainers, Shelly, is training this girl, Lisa. And Lisa's in her early 30s and she's going to be, be getting married pretty soon. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear for that man. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, she's a nice lady, but anyway. You better, you better hope Kelly's not listening That's to this right. episode. Uh, <laughs> she's extremely, she's ex so far on the glycolytic spectrum that her first workout, she worked so hard, she literally went to vomit after like four exercises. Okay. Oh my gosh. Only the second, she didn't vomit on the second, and then she did on the third. I told Shelly, look, for this girl, she doesn't stay on the machine any more than a minute. That's it. One minute, boom, four exercises, okay? Well, she doesn't have the problem with the nausea anymore, right? But her resistance has increased rapidly. And she's only made a few alterations to her diet, really just by increasing the protein content and reducing carbohydrate. And she dropped 12 pounds in a relatively short period of time. It's unbelievable how quickly she responded to it. But if we tried to train her the other way, um, you know, for more time under load, literally her metabolism just couldn't handle it. I mean, she doesn't adapt well to endurance training at all, but she's literally a high intensity superstar. Yeah, it, it's 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 astounding how much variation exists between people, and, and uh, you know how. Like Mike said, some people will be observing other clients working out and say, that person's not even breathing hard or they're even working out hard and vice versa. It's like they look at the person after three exercises, you know, crawling on the floor out of breath and they think, oh, they're just faking it. There's no way, you know, like they're being, you know, they're being all <laughs> or, melodramatic. Or they, or they judge themselves and think, uh, uh, like, no, why no, am I not, no. why am I, I thought I was working hard. Obviously, I'm not working that hard. And, and it's, uh, what's amazing is some people can, they literally can come in here and they have, every session is slotted for 30 minutes and they can be out in eight minutes, yeah. you know. Right. Wow. right. So, yeah, that would be the glycolytic side. But, you know, I have a question for you now, uh, which comes to mind. When you have that oxidative person that, you do nine exercises with them, and uh, at the end, they look like they just, you know, basically got, you know, that they, they didn't do anything. They just got out of bed. They, you know, they're fresh as a daisy. Are you? Is is it your goal as a trainer to somehow push their energy systems to the point where they do pant and get their heart rate up at no matter what, you know, 
at all costs? Are you trying to do that or do you just accept the fact that they're never going to get to that point, but they're still going to be gaining muscle? Because what's the point of all this? We're trying to, whether they're oxidative or glycolytic, whether they're somebody that has, you know, slow twitch muscle fibers and endurance type fibers or glycolytic, isn't the goal to ultimately build muscle for that person? And do you have to get them to that point of exhaustion where they're panting uh, to, to help them build that muscle? Or do you accept the fact that they're never going to be breathing like a freight train, uh, but they're still going to get stronger? So, I mean, our number one goal with resistance training, right, is to have that person get stronger. And that's the, our objective measurement of improvement. And over time, as that load increases and that absolute intensity increases, it's going to affect them eventually metabolically. But, I mean, our main goal is to get them stronger in the ad muscle. Okay. Now, it depends on what the client's goal is. For example, I recently I had this uh, lady, Leslie. I've been training her for a number of years. And her and her husband, they went to uh, on a biking trip in Europe. Okay, so she wanted to increase her cardiorespiratory a little more. And for those people that that is their goal, uh, we will offer you know the high intensity interval training on a cycle ergometer. So it really depends upon what their goals are in the long term. Just for people that just want to function in their day to day everyday life. I don't necessarily think that's necessary. But again, it all depends on what their goals are. And so if you can if you can get that person stronger, that oxidative subject stronger, that's all that really matters. Now, let me take a step back one. We we often use the term intensity. Mm-hmm. And I write this I wrote this a long time ago in that I use three different types of intensity to define intensity. Okay. If you look in the research literature, they're going to define intensity as a percentage of the one repetition maximum. So that's what they use in the research. And I call that just intensity of load, meaning for them doing 80% of a one rep max is higher than doing 50% of a one rep max. Uh, That's not the type of intensity that you and I think of. You and I think of intensity as the degree of momentary effort. Okay, and I call that either relative intensity or intensity of effort. But then there's another intensity, and I don't think a lot of people look at this, which I call absolute intensity. Okay, and what I mean by absolute intensity is the total stress that the body can tolerate at one time, or at least over time. Okay, so let's say you have any subject, let's say they start out, they come in really weak. I'm sure you've seen people like this, right? Let's say they start out chest press and literally they can only do 30 pounds before they reach failure on chest press. I mean, I've had, you and I probably have both had, have had people who've never exercised in their entire life. Okay, Mm -hmm. but you train that, that person over a certain amount of time and they literally over triple their strength. They're doing more than 90, 96 pounds, 100. Their absolute intensity has effectively tripled. So the total stress that their body is tolerating at that point in time has really gone up. And I think what we want to see when we say we want to see someone stronger, we want to we see their absolute intensity increase. And when we increase their absolute intensity, if they're doing much more of a workload, right, or for that specific time that they're working, then eventually it is going to have a a pretty big effect on on their metabolism, Mm -hmm. on their metabolic system, on the cardiovascular system. So for everyone, as they get stronger, they're going to be increasing that absolute intensity. Do you recommend doing intervals for people that uh, that you notice are, are primarily a, a slow twitch muscle fiber type versus the strength training? Do you, th- do you feel mixing that in is, is helpful to get their heart rate up and to push their me- their metabolism? You know, again, it all depends on what that person wants. I mean, there's some people that just don't want to do that. There's some people, you know, I mean, New Orleans is, a, is an interesting place, as you know, and our number one activity is probably drinking alcohol for most people <laughs> that, that live here. <laughs> That's no joke. No, <laughs> no, that's true. Pretty much can't do anything in the city unless it involves alcohol. So, <laughs> and, <laughs> and music. And music, Exactly. Right. Totally. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of people. So, you know, selling what we do actually sells pretty well because uh, – 
many people don't want to do more than 30 minutes one day a week. Okay. Now, you know, if they want to, if that is part of their goal and they want to really increase that, yeah, that's an additional service that we offer. But again, that person might not want to pay for that service. They might not want to pay for it. They may not be interested. They might not be able to afford it. They might not want to come back a second time of the week to do that or, or even, you know, not have enough time to dedicate to it at and that training session or whatever the case may be. So I have found that for oxidative subjects, uh, incorporating intervals depending upon their goal, it, it, it does – uh, help them. I, I've had some clients tell me, again, a very small handful, this is what I felt like I've been missing by just doing the resistance training. Like, so even though they've gotten stronger, they some people want to feel that, you know, that type of in, that push. That, and some people don't. Now, again, we all go back to the individual client and what their goals are. Yeah. I, and here's an observation, you know, like uh, we have clients who, um, if they do the MedX chest press and they do it to muscle failure, but it doesn't display, like they don't feel like they got that cardiovascular uh, uh, push. And then uh, I'll have them do like on that same day later in the session or on a different session, uh, slow push ups, like five seconds down very, very slowly and five seconds up. And, and, when they go to muscle failure in that exercise, which obviously is not just a chest exercise, uh, um, they are much more metabolically challenged and actually feel that there is um, – like their heart really was working and that the intensity that they saw somebody else do on a machine, they actually did be, when they held a plank, did some wall squats or did, you know, like a body weight exercise versus uh, a machine. Um, um, based on that observation and pushing the uh, – like what, what, what do you say about that in regards to uh, what's going on with the body right there? I would say I'd have the same observation as you. Exactly. Totally. Those people can not only tolerate a longer time under load but can usually do more exercises in, in the workout. And um, I mentioned before some of the early work that um, Arthur Jones did before he started MedEx. They, um, the stuff was never made um, available to the public. He was doing some testing with uh, servo-powered Nautilus isokinetic devices. And he, he he saw everybody got that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for those so, listening in the podcast, hit the fifteen second button to go back fifteen seconds to absorb that. Hey Ryan, Ryan, just do me a favor, real fast. Yeah. Explain what an iso isokinetic yeah. machine is, because a lot of people don't know what yeah, isokinetic is. Because it's all ball bearings these days. So. <laughs> exactly. So what an isokinetic machine does is uh, the well, it, these were servo explain. powered. So what right. they do is it limits. It limits movement at a specific speed. So you can literally try to lift it as hard and as fast as you can, and you're simply not going to be able to go any faster. And what Jones was doing is it was a, it was a, it was a Nautilus uh, leg extension machine, which he limited to 25 degrees per second. And uh, a leg extension machine is basically about 110 seconds. I mean, I'm sorry, 110 uh, de uh, degrees. So they were finishing each positive and negative stroke in a little over four seconds. So their reps were lasting about eight seconds. And what he noticed was there was, again, this huge amount of variability, even with the same percentage, the 75% of uh, the one repetition maximum. Um, some people failed in as little as three repetitions, right? So that would be like as little as 24 seconds. And other people, there was some one subject that needed a total of 34 repetitions in order to feel. So that would be another, a, you know, much higher time under load. So, you know, what was cool about that is he wasn't just observing this, but he was actually testing it and documenting it. And I mean, later they started doing this, the something similar with MedEx where they used 50% of the uh, static test or the isometric test, which is, um, you know, basically as much uh, force as you can exert without moving, right? That would be isometric. And 
that was about the same as that dynamic test or uh, with the movement test with the isokinetic. And, but he lo- he noticed this large variability. And so that would be – that would literally be exactly reflected in what we're discussing here today. And um, what he noticed though is that with those oxidative subjects, they don't inroad or they don't um, – create they create a very shallow fatigue where glycolytic subjects create a very deep level of fatigue so for someone who's oxidative not only do they need to stay on the machine more time but they can actually tolerate more exercise and so um it's just like you were saying that if you put an, an, uh, another exercise in there or two whether you're doing push-ups or if you wanted to do like a pre-exhaust type protocol where let's say we did uh, leg curls, leg extension for legs, but then you put them on leg press afterwards, or uh, then you can really get that metabolic demand without doing any of the interval training. That was part one of our two-part interview with exercise physiologist and certified master trainer, Ryan Hall. We'll continue our conversation in next week's episode. And if you happen to be listening down in the Big Easy, hit Ryan up at Exercise Science LLC, personal training and physical rehabilitation for New Orleans, Louisiana. Check out his website at exerciseSciencellc.com. For Inform Fitness locations across the U.S., check out InformFitness.com to find the location nearest you. And to pick up Adam's book, visit Amazon, then add Power of 10, the slow motion fitness revolution to your shopping cart. In the book, Adam discusses the three pillars necessary to burn fat, build muscle, and reboot your metabolism, as well as exercises that you can perform if you are not near an informed fitness location. Or how about a free copy of Adam's book, personally autographed by the guru himself, and perhaps an informed fitness hat, t-shirt, and a hoodie jacket. And for good measure, how about an Amazon Echo to listen to Amazon Music, audiobooks and Audible, and even this podcast through the TuneIn app. Well, if your name is Sandy Derry Hamburg, it's all yours. Courtesy of Adam Zickerman and the entire team at Inform Fitness. Congratulations, Sandy. And thank you and all of Inform Nation for participating in our contest and for being a member of the Inform Fitness family. Look, we have a lot more fun stuff like that planned in the near future, so don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in whichever platform you might be listening from. Until next time, for Sheila Melody, Mike Rogers, and Adam Zickerman of Inform Fitness, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.